Well, hello everyone, wherever you may be. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the focus of our discussion today is on something that is on many minds lately, and that is the war in Afghanistan. Nearly 20 years after uh, US troops entered the country, America has begun its final withdrawal. It is scheduled to end the withdrawal by September 11th, though it may end earlier in July. Last night in an address to the nation, President Joe Biden said American leadership means ending the forever war in Afghanistan. He argued that because the US had achieved its initial goals of eliminating the terrorists that carried out the 9-11 attacks, it is time to leave. Now there's certainly merit to that, but while the US may uh, be ending its role in the forever war, the forever war will not end for Afghanistan, which has really been at war for more than 40 years when the Soviet Union entered the country. Now, Pakistan has been a major factor in the US-led war in Afghanistan, and that's no surprise, given that thinking in Washington about its relationship with Islamabad has long been seen through the lens of Afghanistan. This goes back quite some time, including to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, when the US viewed Pakistan as a key partner in helping fight communism in Afghanistan through support to anti-Soviet Mujahideen fighters. But at that time, uh, in the 1980s, there was more of a common purpose for the US and Pakistan. Uh, their goals were simpler, there was more of a convergence in interests, and it's been so much more complicated and fraught during the US-led war, and especially since the emergence of the Taliban insurgency. Um, there was a uh, degree of convergence in views during the early months of the war when the US and Pakistan were working closely to go after Al Qaeda. But then when the Taliban, which the US quickly uh, removed from power, launched and ramped up its insurgency, the US found itself fighting a nemesis that had long been and continued to be an ally of Pakistan's. So there's a very important story to tell here um, after nearly 20 years about the US-Pakistan relationship and how it's been shaped by the war in Afghanistan. It is a story that's been told before, but uh, we now have a very fresh and fascinating new take on this story produced by the inimitable Zahid Hussein. Uh, his new book, No Win War, The Paradox of U.S.-Pakistan Relations in Afghanistan Shadow, I hope this is in the camera, um, draws on new interviews with key players in the U.S., Pakistan, and Afghanistan, and it re reveals some very striking uh, little-known facts that even close observers won't be aware of. So uh, we are delighted today to be hosting the virtual launch of No Win War. The book's author, Zahid Hussain, is likely no stranger to most of those tuning in today. He's an award-winning journalist and author who's covered national security issues in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region for many years. For both Western and Pakistani news organizations, he's published two books, Frontline Pakistan, The Struggle with Militant Islam, and also The Scorpion's Tale, The Relentless Rise of Islamic Militants in Pakistan and How It Threatens America. And most important, is that uh, Zahid is a former Wilson Center Pakistan scholar. And he worked on this book while he was in residence at the center. And I wanted to recognize and thank the Fellowship Fund for Pakistan, which provided the generous support that enabled us to host Zahid while he was working on the book. So the book is, is not yet available in the US. Um, it will be soon enough, but um, for now, if you'd like to purchase it, uh, please do so by going to the Oxford University uh, Press uh, website and you'll be able to obtain it from there. Uh, Zahid is not going to make any formal opening remarks. We're going to go right into a conversation. And after that, I will take questions from the audience. And on that note, if you have a question that you'd like to pose to Zahid, uh, please email it to asia at wilsoncenter.org or tweet it to at Asia Program. P-R-O-G-R-A-M. And I'll try to get to as many questions as I, as I can. So let's start. Um, and I should have said, I don't think I said this at the beginning. I'm Michael Kugelman. I'm the Senior Associate for South Asia at the Wilson Center uh, here with Zahid Hussein. So first of all, welcome, Zahid. Welcome back to the, to the Wilson Center. Um, first, let's, let's just set the stage here. Uh, if you could tell us a bit, as your book does in its early chapters, what the U.S.-Pakistan relationship looked like right on the eve of the U.S. intervention in October uh, 2001. What did the U.S.-Pakistan relationship look like in the immediate period preceding the war? I think you're still muted, uh, Zahid. Yeah, 
Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, thank you, Michael, for your generous remarks. Uh, and I'm also very grateful to Wilson Center for organizing this event. I have very fond memories of my tenure at the center. It was here, as you mentioned earlier, that I started working on this project. Initially, my research was uh, on Pakistan's tribal areas and regional security, but fast changing situation in region encouraged me to expand the scope, the scope of this. And it has um, come at a time uh, when uh, Pakistan and US relationship, which emerged in nine, soon after 9 11, um, had come uh, full circle. Michael, as you say, asked uh, what was happening, I mean, like, uh, when the 9-11 happened, Pakistan and the US were the relationship between them was quite a strain. It came after 1990s, when soon after Soviet withdrawal of Afghanistan, Pakistan and Afghanistan, Pakistan and America separated on went on their separate ways. And it was the 1990s which where the relationship between the two countries really saw. Um, it, from a uh, uh, very close ally in 1980s in the war against Soviet forces, Pakistan became the most sanctioned country and uh, lots of sanction from the American. First it was nuclear sanction, then it was uh, democracy sanction and a lot more. So when 9-11 happened, at, um, uh, it was a very interesting story that uh, just a few, uh, few days before, uh, General Mahmood, who was um, the uh, ISI chief at, at that point was in the United States and Americans were, I mean, the, a discussion between the uh, from ISI chief and the, uh, and, and, um, and the CIA chief was largely revolved around Taliban and the danger emanating from Afghanistan. At that point, Pakistan was vehemently supporting Taliban. And in fact, the argument was that Taliban are not bad and uh, America should recognize them. But two days later, in, me, in a meeting, when they met after 9-11, um, uh, Josh Tennant and General Mahmood at Langley, the atmosphere was very, very, has completely changed. It was actually American, America was attacked by a global terrorist group. And that uh, was based, Al Qaeda was based in Afghanistan. So it became very imminent that, uh, that, um, that going America is going to a war uh, in Afghanistan. So at that point, Pakistan's, um, Pakistan was needed. Pakistan support was needed because uh, Pakistan was the one country because of its geographical proximity and historic history. Pakistan was the only one country which he had known as or knowledge about uh, the Taliban Afghanistan. So in a way, actually, when uh, uh, when uh, when things changed, Pakistan did not have any choice but to side with America. So it was a beginning of a very uh, uh, of a very you know tumult, uh, very uh, you know, new relationship between Pakistan and United States. But as you mentioned earlier. It was a different kind of relationship. In 1980s, we saw when Soviet forces came into Afghanistan, uh, it was there was convergence of interest between uh, two countries, and that, that led to a very smooth relationship. In fact, actually, both the country fought the uh, you know the uh, most successful covert of uh, war um, in the history. Uh, but um, and when this relationship came, the situation was completely different. There was no, as such, there was no convergence of interest. And that is largely actually based, the relationship, the new relationship was largely based on experience and, uh, and, uh, and compulsion. And that's why actually quite a lot of times it's mentioned as a shotgun marriage. Uh, and then, uh, so uh, it changed the whole uh, scene. Pakistan, which was one of uh, the most sanctioned country, became again actually one of the closest ally of United States. But uh, going through the changing change in policy, or uh, you know, Pakistan was required to undo the government on Afghanistan, which it had supported and which had been propped up by Pakistan. So that was a very you know uh, you know difficult difficult uh, decision for Pakistan, uh, particularly the military government, which is in power, which was in power. So in fact, actually, General Musharraf was uh, uh, um, the military head, and he had to go through a lot of problems, I think. 
and this, and so, uh, but ultimately uh, he 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 um, managed to overcome those difficult and then this this journey of the new alliance started. So what and from the very outset there was some differences of views, which was very clear. Um, Pakistan wanted uh, United States uh, to bring in what it calls reconcilable Taliban. Uh, into the political process. And uh, obviously America uh, did not uh, want that. For, um, for America, every Taliban were terrorists. So basically there was no question of that. So the first thing happened, the relationship, where, and which uh, the breach, uh, I will not say breach, but uh, uh, difficulty start, it started emergency. Uh, soon after the Bonn Agreement um, in December 2001, when a new government was installed, it was led by Northern Alliance, which, which historically uh, had been, uh, in a way, actually uh, hostile to Pakistan. Just in the in civil war, during civil war, Pakistan was siding with Taliban, and the other side was the Northern Alliance. So Northern Alliance came, when came into power, uh, it became very difficult for both, both the country, Afghanistan and Pakistan, to cooperate with each other. And there was the problem. But one thing actually I would say that um, when talking about uh, differences over what to do with the Taliban, uh, uh, the relationship worked very well when it came to Al Qaeda. Most of Al Qaeda leaders who had, were based in Afghanistan uh, fled to Pakistan and there actually had, they were captured. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Bin Al Sheikh, Zubeda, all those people uh, who were uh, uh, supposed uh, were the architect of 9-11. They were all captured in Pakistan. So the cooperation uh, between uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan and America on Al-Qaeda was uh, uh, worked very well. But as far as Taliban were concerned, there was still reservation. But one thing I will tell you before uh, I stop uh, for the other bit, is that um, when, uh, when Taliban government was ousted, uh, 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 most and they started obviously um, uh, leadership and other fighters uh, came to Pakistan. They got sanctuary here, but initially, until 2003, there was no pressure on Pakistan from United States to take action against the Taliban. There was nothing actually, and so they came here. They settled. They knew the place very well, um, and um, because they had been during uh, uh, anti-Soviet war. Most of them had lived in Pakistan, and uh, uh, as you know, if you, across Duran line, the same tribes uh, lived there. So there was no difficulty. So until 2003, there was no pressure on Pakistan to take action against, uh, uh, against Taliban. So that story goes from here. And then we all know that uh, from sanctuaries in Pakistan, they started reorganizing, and then, uh, and then whatever we saw had started happening. Yes, thanks for that, Zahid. And your 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 comment, um, you know, it actually anticipated some of my uh, next question, which is great. Uh, you know, one of them, I think it's an important point that your book makes and gets into how um, the reaction from the or, or the the challenge that the Musharraf government faced in how to respond to U.S. pressure on Pakistan uh, in terms of breaking with the Taliban and working more closely with the U.S. There had been some disagreements within the ranks, so to speak. There were, there were senior officials that did not agree with what Musharraf was uh, wanted to do in terms of working more closely with the U.S. And that was some, that's something that I think plays out in very interesting ways um, in your book, which you, which you alluded to uh, a bit. Um, the next question I was going to ask you, and again, you sort of hinted at this a bit, but I'll, I'll pose it more directly. Uh, you identified a few uh, key moments fairly early in the war that would have a major impact, um, not just on the trajectory of the war, but also on U.S.-Pakistan relations. And I'd like you to discuss two of them briefly, both of which happened in December 2001. Um, and you, you already talked about one, the, um, the Bonn Conference, which of course was an off battlefield issue. This was a diplomatic initiative meant to establish the first post-Taliban government and the Taliban was not present at the conference. It was not invited. Um, the second one is the, um, the Tora Bora operation. Of course, the, the attempt by the US uh, to go after bin Laden uh, through this operation in the mountains. It failed, and instead uh, you had large numbers of, of Al-Qaeda members, including bin Laden, entering Pakistan. 
So could you speak about briefly about what these two events meant for US-Pakistan uh, relations? What, what the impacts of these developments, these events were for the relationship? Uh, first, let me uh, talk about bond agreement, which you mentioned. Uh, that is basically uh, Lakhdar Brahimi, um, former foreign uh, minister of Algeria, who was special in war for, uh, and uh, uh, Dobbins were two uh, from uh, special in war, US in war. They basically uh, were there and organized it. And then, so obviously it was most difficult thing to do because all the PNO, uh, uh, the Taliban, uh, groups which had assembled there. They may have one thing common, uh, this, they, both, they were all anti-Taliban, but they were not a typical uh, situation was there, their uh, fraction, they were, uh, you know, the differences among them was very great. So, but they got, uh, they were uh, finally, were made to agree for an interim government. But an interesting thing is about, uh, what I should like to mention, is Iran's role in in Bonn uh, conference, uh, the, probably the most critical role was uh, uh, getting uh, them on, uh, on, a, uh, on or getting them agreed on the interim arrangement was Iran. Um, Jawad Zarif, um, who is now foreign minister of Iran, was representing Iran delegation. And he basically, because he, the Iranians had a very good relations with Northern Alliance and some other uh, Afghan faction uh, who had gathered there. But, uh, but um, as you said, actually Pakistan was trying, uh, was uh, uh, told um, the American many times that they, the Taliban should be included, it was not. But interestingly, after, after some time, about two, three years later, Lakhdar Ibrahimi, who was, one of the, who was the architect of the agreement, he said in an interview that the ori, it was original sin and uh, to not to include Taliban. But he also argued that uh, it was not possible probably because no Afghan factions would be uh, 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 allowed it. So that was the thing. Uh, so uh, I think probably there was no realization in America at that point that uh, what it was very important uh, to uh, fight uh, this war was to have the cooperation between Kabul and Islamabad. But after that, there was uh, hardly any cooperation. I remember actually going to Kabul that point and the first thing I would hear that Pakistan it means uh, Pakistan is responsible for everything. So I've, obviously they could not work together. So that was a one uh, uh, one thing. Uh, uh, the second uh, thing uh, you have uh, mentioned, sorry, uh, the second point you have just mentioned is, was um, uh, mm, uh, sorry, uh, the Tora Bora. Uh, Tora, offensive. yeah. Tora Bora offensive. Yes, I think probably that was also like uh, Pakistan was supposed uh, uh, supposed to provide logistic support to United States. The United States forces were using three bases in Pakistan, Jakabad, Sibi, and other places uh, for for their logistic supply. But as far as the war in Afghanistan was concerned, Pakistan was not taken into confidence at all. And on Tora Bora, you rightly pointed out when Tora Bora was happening. Um, Pakistan came to know much later, um, and in fact, actually, um, uh, uh, Pakistan ambassador at that point in Washington was informed by Chinese uh, ambassador about what was happening, and later on, um, uh, Pakistan was taken to confidence. But it became too uh, late because what happened after Tora Bora, as you mentioned, that uh, they fled to Pakistan. So Pakistan has hardly any troops on the border. And particularly in this a very treacherous mountainous era area, and also actually because they are they were uh, they were part of the tribal area. There is no more tribal area called tribal area. But at that point, Pakistan did not have a military presence in those regions, so it was very difficult to stop their uh, uh, their uh, coming here. And uh, lots of uh, they came here because this porous border. It could be some of them drive through their ways and um, uh, almost all of the, all the leaders, except one uh, leader was killed in Afghanistan, uh, was Atif, and the rest of them all came to Pakistan. So um, thank you for that. And I wanted to, to fast forward just a bit, going chronologically, and since there's 20 years to discuss, I'm going to fast forward just a bit um, to what is really a, a seminal 
moment uh, in the war and also a seminal year in the war and a seminal year for the for the US Pakistan relationship 2011 um, you know, as, as you know the the uh, Obama administration had announced a troop surge in 2009 which entailed sending thousands of troops into Afghanistan to, into 2009 2010 um, only to have them start withdrawing at a later specific point so um, the height of the troop surge was in 2011. That's when you had the most uh, US forces in the war at any time. And I think that combined with other NATO forces, there were about 150,000 total NATO, NATO forces in Afghanistan in 2011. But this was a disaster of a year uh, for US-Pakistan relations. And you know, at a moment when, when the US was trying uh, to do everything it could to tame this insurgency, anger in Washington was building in Pakistan for its continued support um, for the Taliban. And this was, of course, the year when, when Admiral uh, Mike Mullen famously or infamously said the Haqqani network was a veritable arm of the ISI. It was the year of the, the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad, which of course marks its 10 year anniversary this coming Sunday. And it was also the year when you had that uh, NATO uh, assault that killed uh, Pakistani border troops. It was just a very bad year. Uh, uh, for U.S.-Pakistan relations. So if you could just speak a bit about you know, how bad was it uh, in, in 2011 and what were the implications of these tensions in the relationship that year? Uh, what were the implications of that bad blood for the war effort and for U.S.-Pakistan relations in the years, in the years that followed? Uh, you're right, actually, it was a very critical phase uh, of, uh, of the relationship. In fact, actually, the, uh, the differences occurred from very uh, beginning when, uh, when President Obama decided to send more troops, uh, 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 about 170,000 troops were sent, uh, um, and, uh, and more NATO forces including. Um, so on uh, the basic uh, differences between Pakistani military leader and, and American, that the Patriots was uh, at one uh, at that point was uh, the head of CENTCOM, then later he became uh, the head of ISI, uh, ISF uh, forces. But there was basic difference between General Kiani and uh, General Patrius on the issue of how to fight this war. Uh, there was a huge difference between what was called counterinsurgency uh, uh, policy or strategy, uh, which Patrius uh, did, uh, want, uh, wanted to apply in Afghanistan. Pakistan's argument was that it would not work. And from the way it was, um, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, um, uh, General Kiani wanted America uh, to, um, to talk to Taliban. I mean, there was a difference also that uh, the, at that point, uh, the America's policy was for, for integration. Uh, that is to integrate uh, what they call uh, those um, uh, Taliban leader, middle level leaders who could be, um, could be uh, separated from them and integrate them. Uh, while Pakistan said it will not work. It will be, uh, it's a reconciliation we should work and, and the policy should be from upside to down, but not otherwise. So that was the basic reason of differences. And I think probably the history will tell us that uh, really Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, it did not work that conference. There was no exit plan as such. Uh, then actually nine, uh, 2011 happened. And as you rightly pointed out, it was like the frustration was going because the, uh, the war in Afghanistan was not going anywhere. It was not actually had delivered anything conference. So there was much more pressure on Pakistan. And uh, the pressure was um, was that to take action against um, Taliban and particularly Haqqani group, uh, which uh, uh, had was based in north North uh, Waziristan and they have been operating there and they have uh, have, come, have uh, turned to be the major force uh, behind the uh, insurgency. So uh, nine uh, so in 2011, first thing happened during that period. America started building a uh, structure of their own CIA. Because um, what happens like, in Pakistan and yes, the new uh, the CIA operatives who are posted in, in the country are known to ISI, notified to ISI. But we saw actually a huge number of uh, ISI operatives came on diff on visa like, undercover, and that was the you know the tension has heightened. And then we saw Raymond Davis affair happen. 
and that was actually uh, it was a clock and dagger uh, situation. In fact, actually, I've quoted uh, uh, former uh, CIA station chief that we are enemies now. So that was a point actually when America even refused to uh, you know, recognize initially that he was a CIA uh, operative. And that actually continued for about one, uh, more than one month, the whole episode. And that it was really a very uh, a testy situation. And finally, it was resolved. Uh, it was resolved in a way, so as a bargaining, it was um, uh, that money was paid to the victims, uh, families of victims, the two people who were killed by Raymond Davis. But uh, uh, there were other part of it also that uh, with condition that America should pull out all those operatives from Pakistan. And they had to do that. Then soon after that, actually, when it was just, to, it was settling, situation again was settling. Then um, uh, uh, this uh, Aftabad incident happened where, uh, where Osama bin Laden was killed. That was also like, it, was, it put Pakistan into a very awkward situation, I must say awkward situation in a way that, um, uh, well, actually there was a kind of a feeling of humiliation uh, and that the unilateral action uh, about America. So, uh, and also actually Pakistan had to, you know, explain or rather actually what accused that uh, either it was an intelligence failure or it was being um, uh, provided sanctuary, uh, was, uh, Sama was being protected. So in a way, actually, this was very, very difficult situation for Pakistan. That were not much, as, in fact, actually, as far as the U.S. Pakistan relations is concerned, but internally, it created a lot of problem, a lot of problem. Like uh, I, I have gone into detail, actually, what was happening within the government and also within the civil and military relationship and all kind of things. So, but still, actually, it, uh, it was managed. One thing good about uh, apart from all those things which is happening on the surface, you know. Uh, one thing which allowed the relationship to work was the, you know, back channel contact. You know, throughout this crisis period, there was always a back channel, uh, if, uh, uh, which basically um, helped in diffusing the situation. But worse happened in Salala, um, this bombing of, uh, by the American forces on Pakistani coast, which killed about several uh, Pakistani uh, soldiers. That was a very, uh, that was a, I would say, a turning point. A turning point means uh, that um, uh, America's refusal to say sorry about that. That actually created a lot of problem. And I think probably uh, at the end, uh, the, the, uh, the, the issue was resolved. Uh, but uh, it had left as kind of, it was a defining moment. And I think probably that was the point where uh, the relationship turned into purely transactional. And even actually there was a question whether which was a transactional relation anymore or not. So that has changed the whole, uh, whole uh, no, relationship uh, uh, between the two countries. Yeah, thanks. And, and indeed, the, the Salala raid and had um, those um, Pakistani border uh, troops killed uh, in that NATO uh, assault. You know, I think that was, of course, a moment when Pakistan shut down uh, the supply routes on its soil, which I think was a um, a wake-up call for, for many in Washington that recognize just how important those those supply routes are. It, it, it imposed yeah. some hardships, so to speak, on, on NATO forces. And it's an important reminder because many who are more um, uh, critical of Pakistan and Washington have long believed that um, uh, harsher steps should be taken against Pakistan to try to get it to cooperate more with U.S. goals in Afghanistan. But, you know, sort of the pushback on that idea is that if uh, if, if Washington were to try to take a harder line on Pakistan, Pakistan could retaliate again by closing down those supply routes. I think that's a really critical point. A uh, quick follow-on point from what you just said about um, how the tensions got real bad in 2011. You know, a, a significant amount of collaboration between the, the, the uh, U.S. and Pakistan during the war, during the war in Afghanistan, has been carried out uh, between the intelligence agencies, the CIA and the ISI. But as you've noted, there were deep, deep tensions between them that exploded in 2011, um, seeing each other as enemies. So how, how was it possible, in essence, to carry out further collaborations given the huge amount of mistrust? Because things were still happening. The drone war, which had really got ramped up uh, uh, during the Obama administration, the beginning of the Obama administration, it continued. 
So were the two able, were the two intelligence agencies still able to keep cooperating on substantive levels post 2011? Well, yes, actually, you're right. Actually, uh, uh, after Salala, at least Pakistan proved one thing to America that um, it could, uh, the, how important the relationship is when you mentioned about uh, when Pakistan closed the G lock, uh, a ground line of uh, communication. So that has actually, and, uh, but uh, I think uh, it, it was also resolved. But interestingly, while uh, there was clock and dagger game going on between two and ten, there was a lot of cooperation also. A lot of cooperation. I mean, like uh, on Al-Qaeda, on terrorism. Even then, actually, if you see after 2011, one, uh, another important development took place. Initially, when Obama uh, uh, came to power, I think they were uh, they were convinced that there would be a could be a military solution to Afghanistan uh, war. Um, but in 2011, 2012, after 2011, 2012, there was actually greater realization that um, uh, this is uh, cannot be won, and there need to be uh, some kind of uh, political dialogue or political settlement of uh, of the crisis. And at that point, actually, uh, but still, actually, there was um, I mentioned because I have also spoken to a lot of American uh, officials also. The, it was largely actually the division within uh, the American administration which uh, delayed any uh, or uh, you know uh, torpedoed anything uh, any dialogue between with the Taliban, um, General Patriots um, and others. Uh, they would, uh, it was anathema uh, for them to talk Taliban, uh, and I think probably only uh, Holbrook, uh, unfortunately, he passed, uh, died um, uh, very early. He was the only person who was advocating for uh, for, uh, for negotiation for the Taliban. But after that, I think uh, then um, then when America uh, decided to start some uh, to, uh, negotiation with the Taliban, then Pakistan came into a picture again, and it was largely Pakistan's effort also to bring uh, the uh, the Taliban to negotiating table. I'm not saying that it was only Pakistan's effort. Pakistan Taliban had also been indicating for long that uh, they would uh, they are willing to talk to America. They were not willing to talk to uh, to Kabul government, but they were always ready to talk to uh, to uh, to Tal. Uh, and then Pakistani role was very very important. But in fact, actually, that when cooperation, it was very uh, during Pakistan, when Pakistan uh, uh, was also fighting its war on literacy, uh, its own tariq -e Taliban or basically TTP or uh, Pakistani specific Taliban. So in that way, when Pakistan was confronting them, there was huge cooperation between them. As, as you've said about um, um, drone strike, drone strike had become a signature, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, policy of doing Obama's. Uh, it was basically uh, when Obama came to power, and there has been significant um, rise in in in, uh, in drone strike, uh, and but there are two sides of it. Initially, Pakistan, in a way, uh, was collaborating with America in the initial period in the drone strikes. So the the it was like this actually when U.S. whenever they would uh, get some information, they would uh, then. Uh, they send the information to Pakistan, and finally, when players used to come, then the strike would take place. But later on, actually, Pakistan was completely, uh, you know, Pakistan was not given any information, and it was unilateral action mostly. And that also, uh, you know, caused tension to rise. And I think there was some, um, you know, some of the, still Pakistan uh, official would say that some of them were very useful because uh, they killed a lot of uh, uh, Al-Qaeda members and also some of the key Taliban, Pakistani Taliban leaders too. But um, they were also actually growing tension on this issue. But thanks. So I'm here in conversation with Zahid Hussein discussing his uh, new book, No Win War. Um, if you have questions for him, I'm going to get to them in just a few minutes. But uh, if you have a, a question, email it to asia at wilsoncenter.org or tweet it to uh, at Asia program. But just a few more questions for you, uh, Zahi, before we go to the audience. Um, wanting to speak briefly about another key year for the war, and that's 2014. That was, of course, 
the year when the U.S. Um, ended its formal combat role. Uh, the combat mission formally ended at the end of that year, and it transitioned into the training and advising mission that's remained in place to, to, up to today. So uh, what was, um, could you talk a bit about Pakistan's um, thinking about that, uh, that withdrawal or that the end of the, of the combat mission? Um, what was the view on that move? Did, did, does, the, uh, does Pakistan think that it uh, came at the right time? What did it mean for Pakistan and, and so on? How would you respond to that? Well, actually, uh, there was a criticism on, uh, or basically a difference of view when Obama announced uh, the surge and that he gave a deadline of 18 months. Um, and I think probably that was the biggest blunder made by o Obama administration because uh, when they gave a deadline, Taliban sat uh, uh, and happily and waited for the time because they knew actually that after uh, that America uh, intends to leave Afghanistan after 2014 and the famous phrase used by a Taliban commander, really, that uh, America has the watch and we have the time on our side. And that really, so that was also a difference of views on, uh, on Pakistan, uh, also the way it was fought. And the other thing is that um, uh, there was also argument, I, I'm not saying that correct or wrong, there was also argument because one of the uh, uh, part of the policy was to, uh, to train um, uh, Afghan forces which would take uh, you know the security responsibility after um, uh, u.s forces leave and there was a lot of argument on that that uh, uh, that uh, how effective they will be and there was also concern and kiani has mentioned has uh, uh, talked about it to afghan sort of american officials but that actually how long can you um, uh, really uh, uh, fund that four to five four to six billion and once actually you leave what would happen that force and there's always the danger that it could disintegrate and then what we had seen in two, uh, 1990s could happen so that was those things and i think probably pakistan uh, point of view at that point in leaving afghanistan without the political settlement at that point i think would not I would create a lot more problem for uh, not only for, for Afghanistan but uh, for Pakistan too. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so many of the questions coming in relate to uh, more recent times, including the present and, and the future. So let's sort of turn to that. Of course, there's been over the last few years a, a peace and reconciliation process, which has moved very slowly. Uh, the US and the Taliban reached an agreement last year, and you now have this nascent intra-Afghan dialogue in place, but it's more or less moribund for now. And certainly the Trump administration and also I think that the Biden administration view uh, Pakistan as a, as, as a key player. Um, so if you could talk a bit about what role Pakistan played in the initial phase in which uh, the US, uh, the Trump administration and the Taliban were having their negotiations leading to the agreement they signed last year. And then in terms of the role of the Taliban uh, now, uh, which is much more complicated, of course, because the Taliban had all along wanted to have negotiations with the US about a troop withdrawal. But it's much more complicated when it comes to what Pakistan can do in terms of pressuring the Taliban to reduce violence and stay committed to the peace process, which is what the US wants Pakistan to do. It wants to apply that type of pressure. But what's your assessment of what Pakistan has done in terms of its role in this, this very nascent peace and, and reconciliation process? Has it been helpful? Can it be helpful? And particularly in terms of pressing the Taliban to rein in the violence? Well, surely uh, Pakistan's um, help uh, in facilitating talks was quite important and uh, significant that way, uh, that, um, uh, that persuading Taliban to come to the negotiating table. And the most, most important was when it was, I mean, it was uh, this uh, negotiation went for more than a year, um, and uh, there was a lot of time actually where the problems uh, kept uh, up, uh, and whenever those uh, those problems emerged, Zalmi uh, uh, al would go to Islamabad and uh, try to, uh, you know, get Pakistan to solve that issue. So that that way, Pakistan's role has been very very important. But uh, saying that, actually, that one cannot say that Pakistan could, uh, uh, you know, dictate terms to, to Taliban. It, uh, the, the, they have certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, influence on them, but uh, it's, there's also a limit to that. And that has uh, several times we have seen the limitation of that, um, and that influence. Uh, like for example, Pakistan at one point was, uh, uh, was uh, trying to convince the uh, Taliban to, um, to agree to at least um, you know, reduction in violence, but, Pakistan, but Taliban decide their own way. And also actually like, yes, at one point earlier part, or say until the negotiations start, Taliban basically, most of the Taliban leaders were based in Pakistan, the families were there, so that kind of, uh, you know, Pakistan had something, uh, some uh, pressure could be used at that. But later on, that, uh, that influence started receding also, when Taliban find their, I mean, started negotiating they were growing international recognition of Taliban intention. They opened their office in Doha. So that also actually, uh, you know, the, the influence has um, uh, also whatever uh, was expressed, it also receded. They still may have some goodwill, but uh, not, they cannot. So in a way, um, now uh, situation, uh, I mean, after Doha agreement, in fact, actually, in, uh, after Doha agreement, uh, Pakistan officials said that their, their policy was vindicated because throughout the 20 years they have been taught, they have been trying to convince America to negotiate to to come to uh, to uh, to go for negotiated uh, settlement, but it did not happen. So it was some kind of vindication of Pakistan policy, and it is still very interesting uh, what happened during that period. Uh, uh, the, Taliban uh, uh, delegation comprised Mullah brother who was in, in Pakistani prison for nine years and he was kept in prison on American behalf. American did not want him to be released. And so when they were released, he played a role. And then five others were former Guantanamo prisoners. So that also has, was the you know, irony of the whole situation that for so long, 20 years, it had, uh, America was fighting these people who were declared as a terrorist, but America was negotiating them. And one of the, uh, uh, the part of the delegation was the Haqqani, one of the Haqqanis. So all that came, you know. So now Pakistan's, for uh, coming back to Pakistan's role, Pakistan can still play a role in, uh, uh, for uh, you know, some kind of, you know, this and drama talk, but uh, it is becoming more and more difficult for Pakistan. And in fact, I, uh, 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 recently, in fact, a uh, senior military officer said, it is much easier to talk to uh, President Ashraf Ghani than to the Taliban. <laughs> so, you know, what I mean, actually, so there's also always a limit to what Taliban, Pakistan could uh, in, do. But Pakistan's interest is certainly, is that some kind of um, pa Taliban should be part of the mainstream uh, 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 politics and they should uh, be the part of the entire government also, but uh, I don't think the Taliban will be listening. Yeah, thanks. And I think you've hit on a, a key, uh, one of the many disconnects in US-Pakistan relations, perceptions of, of the leverage that the Taliban, that the Pakistanis enjoy over the Taliban. I think that many in Washington are, are have expectations that uh, Pakistan would believe to be uh, misguided in the sense that there's a view here that there's much more that Pakistan can do to try to pressure the Taliban, whereas Pakistan would conclude, as you just observed, that there are limits to what you can, to what they can do. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's another important point. So let's now get to uh, a question that several people have asked about, um, and that is the, the impending uh, US withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan. So two questions on this. Um, one, what does your reading of the US-Pakistan relationship during the war in Afghanistan tell us uh, perhaps about what could become of the relationship once the US has ended its role in the war? Uh, and what might the expectations of Pakistan be of the United States post withdrawal? What might the expectations of the US be of Pakistan? And the second point, Related to this is that, you know, as you know, one of the major uh, objectives for the Biden administration now is to figure out how to retain a counterterrorism capacity vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan when it no longer has any troops on the ground, because the administration says that every troop is leaving. Um, 
So, you know, there's been a lot of discussions about negotiations that the U.S. is having with various regional players about the possibility of getting basing arrangements, being able to house some U.S. troops in other countries. So Pakistan obviously is one that, that comes to mind because of the precedent. I mean, as your book describes, I mean, there is a history of, um, of, uh, of, of U.S. forces using, um, uh, U.S. personnel using Pakistani military facilities and soil in its effort to, to wage the war in Afghanistan. Uh, now, publicly, the, uh, the messaging from Islamabad is that no, we're not open to that. But what's stated publicly is not always what's stated privately. So the question for you is, do you think that there could be possibility of continued uh, counterterrorism cooperation between the US and Pakistan uh, post-Afghanistan withdrawal that could allow for some of the basing arrangements that have been provided to the US during the war? Well, as far as the U.S.-Pakistan relation is concerned, over the last several years, it has become in a transactional relationship. In fact, actually, after Doha, it was more of a transitory relationship. There's not even semblance of what was earlier said, strategic alignment. There's nothing like that. So Pakistan has been seen by the United States, unfortunately, through Afghan, only Afghan prison. Because Afghanistan was the pivot around which the whole relationship was built after 9-11. And that actually become much more actually, you know, uh, narrowed uh, over the last few years. The Americans' uh, interest in Pakistan, uh, or there was convergence of interest in, in, uh, to this extent that uh, uh, to how to exit this war in Afghanistan. And Pakistan is still remain very important. And it was also Pakistan's interest that uh, there should be some kind of uh, end of this war. So that, um, that, uh, that's why actually we still see uh, Pakistan being uh, seen a little uh, um, uh, as an important country. I'm not a lie that much, but certainly kind of, yeah. So um, uh, it's still actually the, uh, the focus uh, of United States or their, uh, the, the way they are, uh, you know, and they want to deal with it is purely, still purely uh, from the one prison, and that will continue. But other thing also very important, like when we see, when we talk about US-Pakistan relation, the changing geo regional geopolitics will also play a very important role in future relationship between the two countries. What we see, is, uh, we've seen for the last uh, seven years, uh, and Pakistan and China have always been, uh, had a, some kind of strategic relationship, but that relationship has gone much, has taken much wider dimension now, much more dimension, and Pakistan has become much more closer to uh, China. That has also been, actually, I'm not saying the major source of, uh, uh, of attention, but certainly a point uh, in, in attention. So that alignment has, has strengthened over the years, and particularly when the there's a feeling on Pakistan that um, yeah, America's, America's um, policy is completely now shifted. Uh, obviously, we have already seen with Biden, President Biden coming to power, the main focus of American foreign policy is the Asia period, the whole Obama's term. And in fact, it was Biden's term. Uh, uh, and that is still there. That means actually a new alignment in the region for what we dis uh, describe as, as India becoming much more, uh, much more closer to the United States and being seen as a strategic, you know, allies, allies. So that way, a new alignment is emerging in this region. Pakistan sees much closer to China, India and America are becoming, Nexus uh, becoming much stronger. So that is also going to, uh, to have influence on, on the overall policy. But saying all that, it does not mean that Pakistan would not like to have better relations with the United States. Traditionally, they always would like to. So the major uh, in a Pakistan challenge would be how to balance the two relationships. And I think probably that's the feeling that it's not a zero-sum game that if we are close to China, that can still have, can have uh, better relations um, with the United States. But what would be the nature of that, uh, that uh, relationship? That is more important. One is obviously, uh, uh, you know, the, inter uh, the interest in Afghanistan. The again, actually, what Pakistan expect because all the American aid has almost dried up. No, uh, I think uh, there's hardly any military uh, aid coming to Pakistan. 
and so basically a little bit of uh, civil, civilian aid, but it is not you know, very important. So Pakistan will expect actually that uh, it should not be just the prism of Afghanistan, but should also have see a uh, relationship should be developed you know, around uh, economic uh, cooperation, trade and other things. So basically the whole nature of, uh, of relationship could be changed. And let's see actually, uh, because the, the thing is that we have not seen yet that President Biden reaching uh, out to Pakistan leaders. He has spoken to lots of uh, leaders around the world, but uh, there hardly been any uh, you know, this, uh, high level contact between the two countries. And interestingly, you know, still um, uh, Secretary of State uh, Lincoln spoke to to General Kamar Bajwa, Chief of Army Staff, when America was announcing his deadline, I mean, leaving the process. So it is still the nature of a relationship is still not very clear. So. No, you're right. And if I'm not mistaken, there has not been any uh, US cabinet official that's yeah. had a conversation with Imran Khan. Uh, it's from, right. from the Biden administration, yeah. Um, so. One question uh, sort of along these lines of what to expect after the US leaves, a uh, question from the audience. Uh, what kind of new pressures may Pakistan feel uh, from the US if after the withdrawal, the Taliban mounts a major offensive that threatens the government in Kabul? Do you think there could be um, new pressures from the US towards Pakistan and what might those look like? Well, I think uh, yeah, it's, um, it's what happen, What could happen in Afghanistan, in the fear of a new civil war, if uh, 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 some kind of political uh, agreement on political setup is not reached? So the, the, the fear is much more in Pakistan. It may happen or may not happen. I'm not saying that it's going to be imminent. Sometimes it happens in Afghanistan. Afghans, if they are led, left to their own you know, uh, things, they could come out with some kind of you know, agreement. But one thing is very clear that, uh, and not only for Pakistan, but also for the region, is that no country would like a return of Islamic Emirates in Afghanistan. And there's no actually, I don't think there's also a possibility of, uh, of Ta Taliban still have managed to get control of a large area in Afghanistan. But um, I think they, they also understand that it's not possible for them to take uh, over uh, the, uh, uh, the government, uh, Afghanistan by a port. So Pakistan, Pakistan concern, the biggest concern is um, uh, if, if uh, civil war, if situation worsens in, uh, in Afghanistan, it will have direct bearing on Pakistan, obviously, as we have seen over the last 40 years, whatever happened in Afghanistan will also affect Pakistan. So that way actually the fear. So I think probably that, that actually point, uh, the America and Pakistan could cooperate uh, on how to, you know, to resolve, uh, so to bring uh, some kind of political settlement possible. So this is what, and I think probably this, is a and the other thing is very important about the regional countries. The role of regional countries are very important there. And I think probably, it's, uh, President Biden rightly said that um, uh, that um, uh, 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 beside intra war talk, the need for UN to organize uh, this meeting because uh, you know Pak we all know that uh, one uh, conflict has never been purely a Afghan's domestic affair. It's always regional countries which had a huge influence on that. So. Pakistan, the other thing is with, uh, uh, with um, the Biden administration and Pakistan, we could cooperate, is basically on counter militancy because, uh, uh, you know, uh, despite the fact that Pakistan has been has able to clear some of their tribal areas from the militancy, but still the danger is there. And, they, and the, the problem is that when, if the situation in Afghanistan remains uh, instable, then there's always a problem that it gives space to the militancy. And I think probably that the uh, United States and Pakistan could have to cooperate in this situation. So these are two or three areas, but basically also um, America should not just see Pakistan from that angle, that, uh, uh, that um, you know, uh, the usefulness on certain things. 
that may not actually work for a very, very long time. So uh, we have, uh, you know, the two countries have to redefine uh, the parameters of new relationship, but it should be beyond uh, focusing on Afghanistan. Thanks, Sahid. And I think you've hit on another key point that highlights why this relationship is so is such a struggle, another disconnect that, um, you know, I think in, in Washington, there uh, is not really yet much of a of a, uh, a focus on this idea of broadening the lens when it comes to looking at Pakistan, uh, uh, which one could argue is not a good idea. But certainly in Pakistan, the messaging in recent months has been on this idea of looking at Pakistan as a key geoeconomic player, as opposed to a key geopolitical player. Um, and I don't know if that's how uh, officials in, in, in Washington would want to look at Pakistan right now, and certainly in the immediate term, as it's focusing on the withdrawal and the consequences of that, uh, of that withdrawal. Um, but we'll see. At any rate, uh, we're, we're going to have to uh, soon enough wrap up. I wanted to ask you one more question. And I think it's a, a, maybe a good question, an important question to ask any author of a new book. Um, and that is, you know, while doing your research and your interviews for this book, um, is there something that particularly surprised you in terms of what you learned or something that may have gone against your, your, your conceptions or your or conventional wisdom? Um, if there were one or two things that you wanted to sort of talk to us about, that would be, that would be interesting. Well, uh, Michael, yeah, actually, when researching and speaking to, you know, the main players in the whole thing, you know, uh, uh, people see the headline, but the most interesting is that what is really happening behind the scene, and that actually quite interesting. That has been very, very interesting for me. Then, uh, if we have, uh, as you had earlier mentioned, that. Uh, he, we all know what was happening on the surface, conflict, this, uh, the meetings, and but really what was happening in the meeting, and I got uh, uh, a lot of the information, what really happened in the meeting and how, you know, discussion took place and which never came out uh, uh, in the media as such. So that was the most fascinating part, fascinating part of me, that what what one said to the other, uh, how that uh, then some of the problems, how the problems were resolved, and how the back channels were used to uh, to you know resolve some of the issues, and uh, so and uh, you know uh, uh, we read uh, that warning was given to Pakistan, some, but basically when when you talk to the leader, so inside it, there was quite a lot of you know. Bonahami also, I uh, you know, the good relationship. Like for example, I'll give you, and I've written at length in my book, uh, that Kiani and, and Admiral Mullen's relationship. Like they were very, very accurate. They, uh, I, you know, they were very close. They met about 26 times, and it was almost like everyone they would meet. And, uh, and uh, you know, and then as, uh, this, the, that statement came, uh, and I, uh, this my book actually okay, well, how it was taken, and then actually the last meeting between General Kiani and Mullen before uh, Mullen uh, retired uh, in Seville in Spain. So all kind of thing was gave me quite insight into in, in, uh, the real story behind the headlines. And I know I don't know how uh, uh, far I've been uh, able to write about that. But uh, that was the most fascinating part for me, actually. And what, like, for example, I didn't mind mention, even actually Pakistan, uh, so Pakistan-US relation had also had a huge uh, impact on pakistan and military relationship, or other, actually, that was also, and, and what was happening there was quite, uh, you know, interesting, like uh, American ambassador to, uh, to Islamabad and Patterson was very influential that way. So that uh, what, uh, you know, she could talk to military leaders, talk to Pakistani civilians, and sometimes both will confide to her, but they would not be talking to each other. So all those things was uh, really actually uh, was fascinating to me. Well, thank you. Indeed, it, it really had. There's so many fascinating stories, and you could recount a number of them uh, in in the book. Um, it really 
was a great read. Again, it's a very timely read uh, because um, you know, US forces are on their way out. I think that it's a, a useful time to take stock of what has happened in Afghanistan over the last 20 years through the lens of the US-Pakistan relationship. Um, I wanted to thank you, uh, Zahid, for, for joining us. It was great to, uh, to be back with you, having a conversation. Again, the book is called No Win War. Um, the Paradox of U.S.-Pakistan Relations in Afghanistan Shadow. I highly recommend it. It's a great read. But I will uh, conclude here. I wanted to thank you all in the audience for tuning in, for your questions. Um, and please, everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, stay well. So we're adjourned. Thank, thank you, you Michael. All. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.